Today, China has a new generation of big spenders. There are more billionaires than any country except the United States, and China now has the most high-income households in the world. And why not? This is a culture with a thousand-year history of commerce, invention and trade. So far, so capitalist. And yet, it's ruled by the Communist Party. It just wasn't expected that a communist country would become possibly the world's biggest practitioner of capitalism. So how did one of the most capitalist countries on Earth end up being governed by a communist party? He had a vision, he had a message about China standing up, to use the phrase that he put forward. The idea of a century of humiliation in which China had been repeatedly invaded and occupied was going to end under his rule. In 1949, Mao announced the birth of a new nation, the People's Republic of China. He made the announcement at the entrance to the Forbidden City, home to so many emperors before him. And as with previous emperors, Mao would assume total control and require total devotion. Mao thought, as it became known, was sacrosanct in China. His philosophies were contained in the Little Red Book. Today, it's still admired by communists and socialists around the world. We must learn to do economic work from all who know how, no matter who they are. We must esteem them as teachers, learning from them respectfully and conscientiously. One quite plausible way to talk about Mao's status is to think of him as sort of a god. He was regarded as, uh, to use one phrase at the time, the shining red sun in all of our hearts. And certainly the cult of personality that surrounded him was very much one that suggested almost the supernatural. With the cultish devotion that he built around himself, Mao was willing to do whatever it took to transform China. Chairman Mao knew his history. He idolized the great nation builders of the imperial past, and he saw himself, like them, as a benevolent despot, as a man who needed to break heads to get things done. And he even bragged about it. He, he once said it, it didn't matter to him if millions of people died, if he got the utopia that he was hoping for. And in pursuit of that utopia, that's exactly what would happen. In 2019, China held a huge parade celebrating 70 years since the foundation of the People's Republic. At its heart was the smiling, benevolent face of its founding father. And yet the celebrations mask a complicated relationship between the people and a man whose policies still cast a long shadow. In 1958, Mao announced what he called the Great Leap Forward a plan to take China through its own industrial revolution to boost the economy. Chairman Mao decided making steel really isn't such a big deal. Everyone can do it. You only need a backyard furnace. And if everybody have a backyard furnace and you all work hard to produce steel, then you will produce steel and China will be able to catch up with the UK, surpass the UK and catch up with the United States. So you had, you know, kind of an industrialization, but on the most sort of primitive and, and uh, ineffective scale. It is like doing it in your own back garden, you know, melting down cooking pots and hoping that you might be able to make a tractor out of them. The steel that was produced from this means was, of course, no use to anybody, but that didn't matter because it was about filling quotas rather than thinking through the idea of what you actually wanted the steel for. And that anomaly, that mistaken way of doing things basically doomed the entire Great Leap Forward from the start. An American documentary at the time condemned Mao's efforts. Stupid as it was, they thought they could replace modern smelting furnaces with manpower. Here was the result. Backyard furnaces which produced crude iron, which cracked and splintered, which was, in a word, useless. <laughs> 
But far worse than the poor quality steel was the effect on agricultural output. Mao had said something like, sort of, dig deep and, um, and your corn will be better. And so they, they dug deep and they planted their seedlings down the bottom, which all failed to thrive because of the lack of light. Such was the fear of disappointing Mao that local party leaders lied about how much grain their regions were producing. People wanted desperately to, um, to prove themselves to be m more red than the, than the next man. You're more likely to get promotion or essentially gain praise if you said that your district was producing much more grain than anyone else. Figures were grossly exaggerated and gave a completely false picture of what, um, what was actually happening, which was I mean, not a particularly brilliant um, production. The authorities thought, well, if there's so much grain there, we can basically bag it up and export it to the Soviet Union to make money. Forced to hand over their food, the results for this nation of peasant farmers were catastrophic. Huge amounts was being seized for sale, and people were being left behind in the countryside with absolutely nothing to eat. And the result of that, of course, was mass starvation. They didn't move because they couldn't. They couldn't because they were, in effect, being locked down. They were not allowed to move. And if you try to leave, then soldiers will kill you. The famine during the Great Leap Forward has been called the greatest man-made disaster in history. Mao's efforts to resurrect China after its century of humiliation had resulted in mass starvation and an industrial policy that saw people melting pots and pans. Meanwhile, around the globe, a new world order was emerging. America had become the dominant superpower. Russia had taken over Eastern Europe and formed the mighty USSR. China, once a world leader, was an embarrassment. But Mao would soon unleash a new revolution, bringing about one of the greatest moments of madness the world had ever seen. Over the last 1,000 years, despite the sweeping changes of communism, the Chinese people have remained deeply rooted to the traditions of their past. From a worship of ancestors, to a reverence for Chinese medicine and ancient superstitions, it's a country steeped in history. But in the 1950s, its leader Chairman Mao wanted to rid China of traditions that didn't reflect his vision of communism. And there was one tradition in particular that he wanted to eradicate, a tradition which prevented many women in the country from being the efficient communist workers that he wanted. My great-grandmother on my mom's side did foot binding. She always walks like a penguin with her band foot. And we remember if we go to supermarkets, we go to department store, she couldn't walk very far. She was always on the stake. And I have never knew she was had a foot binding. I remember very clearly one day we were all sitting there, she unwrapping the tape, beautiful, very, very long tape, right? And then she rolled it up beautifully, so neatly into a bowl. And you see her foot. I remember touching, it's like a baby. So it's so soft at the end, but her toes, instead stretching out, I remember it's curly inside. It's incredible at that time, I thought that she had foot disease. Over centuries, bound feet had become a status symbol, a sign that a woman didn't need to work in the fields. Generations of Chinese women had been crippled by their parents. When you are a baby, very, very, probably three, four, they will break the bone and then bend you in all the bones inwards. So it looked like, like this. So instead of stretching out, it's like this. Then you wrap it very tightly in wet bandages, which will then dry and tighten. And the toes eventually end up completely curled under. It is obviously enormously painful. Um, and it was done to little girls. The mothers and the grannies do it because they fear that their daughters won't get married if they have big feet. No one will want a girl with big feet. And so you have to be tortured in this way. The ideal size it is san cun jin lian. That means a three Chinese inches golden lotus feet. So about three inches, so it's from the middle of your hands 
to the top. That's how small it is. I mean, even for a baby, that's quite hard to achieve. Like so for any, anybody over the age of six, and that is the ideal size. If you achieved that, my marvelous, you will do your family proud and you're married to a very wealthy family and everyone will be happy ever after, apart from you. <laughs> when you're entire in this culture, uh, in the society, sometimes you just don't question it. We all just perform, we all just fit into this, instead of thinking, hang on a minute, do I really want to hurt my children like that? After banning the tradition, Mao unleashed an army of anti-footbinding inspectors. Any women they found would have their bindings hung in their window to publicly shame them. What China Mao really did for China was he was the one said liberation for women. They can go to schools, have education, work exactly like a man. He liberated half of China's population to work for him to succeed in his revolution. That's a unprecedented for China and absolutely liberated the Chinese women in the first level. But Mao's battle with the traditions that he felt held China back didn't end there. He wanted to make China communist to the core, not just its economics and politics, but its culture too. Old traditions, old beliefs, old values had to go. All that remained would be communism. Today, Mao's portrait is everywhere in China. It's even on the money. His face adorns the gates to the Forbidden City, one of China's grandest monuments to its cultural heritage. And yet by the 1960s, Mao had become obsessed with eradicating what he called China's old customs and old culture. The call to cultural revolution in 1966 was essentially the beginning by Mao of an utterly unique political movement. What he decided to do was to motivate various dissatisfied parts of China's population, including the youth, to argue that they must actually rise up against the Chinese Communist Party itself under Mao's leadership and renew the revolution. He felt that, you know, young people were the only ones who were going to be sufficiently enthused and revolutionary. And it was a very kind of disastrous and, 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 and dangerous thing that he did. The Cultural Revolution was really guided by a very utopian vision of Mao's idea of a perfect socialist heaven. Uh, and in fact, for most people, it ended up looking much like hell. Many schools and universities, as symbols of the old establishment, were forced to close. Religious shrines and many private possessions were destroyed. Millions of young people joined a youth militia known as the Red Guard. They were told that the youth was the most valuable, most um, dynamic part of society, that the heart of China's communist revolution really lay in their hands. For many of these young people, that meant things like their teachers in school or their professors in university. Anyone who set themselves up as being um, in a position of power was, was automatically regarded as being corrupt. When the Cultural Revolution started, my mom was only 14 years old. One thing she always regretted was the fact that she didn't understand that they were heavily manipulated by the teachers and the political parties inside the school. It was every teacher to protect their own positions, their own families. Parents could not trust their children, and the children could not trust their parents. Husband could not trust the wife, or vice versa, because any one of them could be under pressure to snitch on the other. In the hands of teenagers, the revolution was spiraling out of control. Many people were paraded in public in what was called the airplane position, by which you would have to hold out your arms at full length for hours on end. Immensely violent means were used, such as simply beating, assaulting, uh, hitting uh, people who had offended against ideological purity. Anybody who says anything that is not complimentary about Chairman Mao, that must be a class enemy. But the humiliations and beatings were about to go too far. 
One morning, Bien Zhongyun, a teacher in Beijing, showed up to work as usual. She was beaten to death by her pupils. I mean, you can imagine that they start by throwing things at her, da, 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 humiliate, and it gets worse and worse and worse. And it is definitely a mass hysteria. And once it's known about, I mean, half the world would be horrified and the other half would think, let's go and do it to our teachers. And so you have an enormous number of, of teachers in, in high schools being beaten to death by their, by their pupils. Despite the killings, Mao continued to support the Red Guard, even appearing in Tiananmen Square, not up on the rostrum, but amongst the people. Many more deaths followed. Many people perished because they were regarded as being heretical, so it was almost like a kind of medieval witch hunt for some people. China, at the end of the Cultural Revolution, would be a place like North Korea today potentially perhaps even more tightly controlled than North Korea today. In order to prove their revolutionary zeal, some members of the Red Guard went to increasingly extraordinary lengths. There were a few occasions when what perhaps one could call revolutionary cannibalism was being practiced. And in those very extreme cases, People were being asked to partake in the flesh of counter-revolutionaries who had been butchered. And if one should refuse to do so, one faced the prospect of becoming the next serving. I think that what, what happens is that people think that that's the worst possible thing you can do. And so what are you going to do to this, this man who is my enemy, who I have now defeated? I'm going to eat him or eat bits of him. In some cases, it's out of desperation because there are people with nothing else to eat. But down in the south, particularly around Guangxi, there was something much more sinister. There was this idea that cannibalism was some kind of ritual revenge and that the party faithful were literally cooking and eating their enemies. The estimated death toll caused by the Cultural Revolution ranged from hundreds of thousands up to 20 million. But despite the catastrophic failures of the Mao era, almost 50 years after his death, Mao's memory is untouchable. I think that the respect that there is in China for him today comes from essentially his role as a founder of the modern Chinese state. The fact that he led the revolution that ultimately led to China becoming a strong country, a country that was finally secure in its own borders, and one that was able to move from being essentially a destroyed post-war society in the late 1940s to becoming the country that would be on the verge of economic superpower status in the 1970s. And Mao would put China on the path to its economic superpower status by doing something utterly unexpected. It would transform the country beyond recognition and has since been called the week that changed the world. In the 1970s, America was the world's dominant superpower. It was liberal, it was capitalist, and it was successful. China, on the other hand, was the world's biggest communist country. They were sworn enemies. There are 700 million Chinese today, one quarter of the human race, and they are taught to hate. Their growing power is the world's greatest threat to peace and life. But by this time, Mao had an even bigger enemy, the Soviet Union, which he felt had lost its way on the road to pure communism. Mao saw there was an advantage in trying to get closer to the US and unite against their joint foe, the Soviet Union. After over 20 years of no diplomatic communications between China and the US, Mao agreed to meet the American president. 1972 saw US President Richard Nixon visiting China and visiting Chairman Mao. And even now, it's clearly a moment of huge historical significance in terms of the changing of the way in which two of the great world powers relate to each other. 
Nixon's visit was an iconic moment in Chinese history because suddenly the great Satan of America was going to be their friend again. Having met Chairman Mao, Nixon confirmed his hopes that the two countries could work together. If our two peoples are enemies, the future of this world we share together is dark indeed. But if we can find common ground to work together, the chance for world peace is immeasurably increased. Chairman Mao has written, seize the day, seize the hour. This is the hour. This is the day. Nixon's visit really let the genie out of the bottle. It had huge consequences for the rest of the world because China as a player in industry, as a source of export goods, but also as a, as a market for import goods, completely transforms all kinds of businesses all over the world. The modern Chinese superstate that we see today began with Nixon's visit to China because everything that happened stems from that. In the decades that followed, China achieved economic growth of around 10% a year, with hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty. I think that the effect of that meeting in terms of changes on China has been immeasurable. I think very few people, perhaps nobody, in 1972 would have predicted that within half a century, China would become the second biggest economic power in the world. But despite China's adoption of some elements of Western capitalism, and despite the wealth that would follow, the country showed no signs of embracing Western democracy. And on one infamous night, it would show the world what happened to those who demanded reform. A millennium ago, China had the biggest population on the planet. It still holds that title today, with 1.4 billion people, almost one in every five people in the world. And for Chairman Mao, growing China's huge population even more was key to making China great. Chairman Mao in the 50s, I think, had said, you know, have as many children as you want, the more Chinese there are, the better. But it, it became apparent that the Chinese population was, you know, massive, massively growing and was going to kind of outstrip food supply. By the time Mao died in 1976, a new leadership was beginning to see the huge population as a major problem. In the mid-70s, um, it was already the case that if you worked in a factory or a library or a museum or whatever, it, that that would have its family planning policy. So, you know, a factory would be told, OK, you can, there can be two babies, two babies born this year. So they would say, OK, you and you, and then the rest of you have to wait. But the population wasn't coming down. So the government took drastic action. Scientists working for the Chinese government, mostly actually in fields like rocket science rather than demography or sociology, decided that the best solution was to limit people to simply one child each. People who broke the rules could be forced to have an abortion and even be sterilized. Only in China can motherhood be not a joy, but a crime. This woman's offence was to conceive a second child. I tried to hide, but there was no escape. Later, two young girls operated, so that I could not get pregnant again. But to the government, forced abortion and sterilisation are mere bureaucratic process. For the child that will never be born, she has this receipt. But apart from the loss of people's reproductive rights, there was another huge problem. One of the victims of the one-child policy were girls who essentially found themselves being discriminated against either before or after birth in certain ways. The assumption was that having a single girl in the countryside wasn't useful enough in terms of agricultural labour, marrying out and so forth. What do you do? You have a choice. You can have a baby daughter or you can terminate. And therefore, there were a lot of people who were choosing to do that. There's certainly evidence in some places that maybe girls, if they were born, disappeared. I mean, very tragically, uh, that kind of situation is definitely reports of that. I remember going down the Yangtze one time 
and seeing a baby's body in the water, and that was a girl. And, you know, that, that's sort of... People did it all sorts of different ways. I mean, they didn't necessarily abort them, but then, you know, if a, if a girl was born, she might be just drowned at birth or killed at birth. Recently, the Chinese government realised that with fewer children being born, their population was gradually becoming older. In 2015, they abolished the one-child policy, ending the most extreme state birth control project in history after 35 years. But its effects will linger for generations. There is an enormous gender imbalance. Now we're talking about um, tens of millions of Chinese men who will never be able to find a wife in China because there are simply no, not enough females in the country to marry them. But for some in the population, the one-child policy had surprising benefits. I wasn't even aware of the one-child policy, was oblivious to the entire concepts until I came to Britain in 1997. Because suddenly, people on the street were asking me, where are you from? I said, I'm from China. I said, oh my God, you're a girl. How did you survive? You didn't get killed or murdered. Such a foreign concept because all the people growing up around me, just like me, we're all just one child. We are the first generation of children born under the one child policy. People who live in the city, like me, really benefited. My parents were able to dot on me, spend all their money so I could study abroad. If I had a brother and sister, that could never happen. The one-child policy really elevated women's position in the society. Because before, if you have brothers and sisters, everything is doted on the boy. Women was always part of the family that you're going to marry off. It's something you can dispose of. But when you only have one, and she or he is everything you have, you, as a family, give everything to them. For people in the cities, life in China was getting easier. They were richer, most of them had only one child to raise. The future was full of promise. But as China got richer, there were growing concerns about the direction the country was headed in. As China was liberalizing economically, there was a section within society who were being left behind. They'd lost what was known as the iron rice bowl, which is the guarantee of state protection, of job security, and of prices for certain commodities. And suddenly they didn't have the kind of protections that communism used to offer them. In 1989, a protest movement began that would become one of the greatest threats to the stability of Communist Party rule. I arrived probably about a month after Occupation Square began. They wanted a photographer that was gonna just basically go there and glue him or herself to the news, which is what I did. The demonstration had begun in mid-April as a show of support in memory of the late Hu Yaobang, the popular general secretary of the Communist Party. He wasn't a liberal, but he was quite a popular leader and seemed to listen to people and so, uh, his death really he kind of precipitated a lot of discontent and brought it to the surface. Illegal protests were not normally allowed in China. It was allowed on this occasion because it started as a vigil for a former general secretary of the Communist Party, which made it rather more difficult for the Communist Party to suppress it to begin with. For a while, an almost carnival atmosphere existed in the square, as protesters for the first time had a sense of what it might be like to live in a liberal democracy. It was like a rock festival. It was uh, upbeat, uh, music was playing. It genuinely felt like an Isle of Wight festival or something. Sort of people stood up around the uh, monuments to the people's heroes, uh, people in tents. But gradually, the vigil began to turn into a protest. People came to the protest for different reasons. There was quite a lot of annoyance about the lack of free speech uh, in China, you know, people not being able to express themselves. 
Um, but corruption, I think, was a, 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 you know, a very significant factor. Today, teachers, lawyers and trade union officials joined the throng. So did prominent journalists from state television and Communist Party newspapers, voicing their embarrassment at censorship of the students' cause. You have uh, a kind of melting pot of annoyed people. There are the students who want more reform, who want more democracy. And there are the, the iron rice bowl people who want less reform and a return to the way that things were. And you've got farmers who just want to get more money for their crops. We've got all of these interest groups converging on the square, and they're all angry with the Communist Party for one reason or another. So the demonstrations continue, and in some ways, it got a lot bigger. It became not only demonstrations by students, but also by people in every walk of life. With each day, the sheer size of the protest had mushroomed at what must have been an alarming rate for the government. In the middle of May 1989, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev traveled to China for a summit, bringing international media attention with him. The dance for democracy did stop another summit event, the carnival crowds preventing Mr. Gorbachev reaching the Great Hall for his press conference. Troops sat helplessly in the corridors as journalists were told the conference had been moved to another venue. If the Soviet leader had arrived, this is what he would have seen from the roof of the Great Hall of the People, the seat of communist power marooned in an ocean of protest. Suddenly, we saw the protest movement in Beijing being splashed across the world. It was enormously embarrassing for the Chinese government. And then, on May 30th, the demonstrators crossed a line. This sort of 10-metre-high styrofoam statue was wheeled into Tiananmen Square, staring out at um, the large portrait of Chairman Mao. She's staring him right in the eyes. It's an incredibly provocative gesture to make towards the centre of Chinese power. It had a very clear resemblance to the Statue of Liberty, a symbol of American independence. That really annoyed um, the government, the Chinese uh, government. Uh, they saw it as inherently and deeply subversive. That was the turning point. Four hours after it went up at 10 o'clock uh, on May the 30th, uh, China declared martial law. Uh, and that meant that um, demonstrations were illegal. It meant that uh, foreign journalists were prescribed, <clears throat> weren't able to report live, uh, the live links were shut down, and the troops uh, started to arrive, 180,000 troops started to arrive uh, from all over China on the 2nd of June. The two sides, if you like, were on a collision course, and nobody quite knew where that would end. Nobody knew. The senior leaders, Deng Xiaoping and people around him, they made the decision that they could not countenance this kind of defiance. And it was a life or death struggle. So the night of the third um, was when uh, the demonstrators were hanging on in Tiananmen Square, determined not to leave. Uh, and more and more, there were these loudspeakers surrounding the square, advising people to go home, to pack up. Um, the troops arrived quite late. And of course, if you send in fully armed, armoured units and having indoctrinated the soldiers that there were counter-revolutionary rebels in Beijing seizing control, the soldiers would do exactly what they were expected to do. They start shooting. An APC was set on fire. Um, I saw a soldier wounded, uh, being carried away from the square. Uh, I turned around at one point and uh, saw a demonstrator who'd been shot fall down. Killings continued through the night, most of them away from Tiananmen Square itself. 
anybody who talks about the Tiananmen Square massacre uh, is misdescribing what happened uh, in Beijing on that night. Most of the killing took place uh, in the western suburbs uh, of the city um, as the troops were arriving through. It's unknown how many died, between hundreds and a few thousand. Despite the trauma of the night, the most abiding image of the event came the next day. We could see um, a row of demonstrators, two rows, rows of soldiers that were shooting uh, at the uh, demonstrators who were uh, uh, s sort of refusing to move. From what I can gather, about 20 people were killed right there and taken off on trishaws. After a while, um, you know, the demonstrators sort of retreated and a hole was kind of created through which the tanks, about 12 of them, started to uh, roll up Chang'an Avenue going east. And a man with two shopping bags had crossed into the middle of the road as if to block them. Tanks started to move down Chang'an Avenue uh, he stood in front of the tank. The tank did a sort of swervy ballad. The whole incident lasted uh, about three minutes. The PSB, the Public Security Bureau, came and took him away, took him to the other side of the road, and that's the last we saw of him. But Stuart had captured a photograph of the moment, and the following day it would be shown internationally. Once again, attention around the world was drawn to China's assault on freedom. To me, photographing it on that day, it didn't feel like very much, but it's incredibly symbolic of, you know, the courage of somebody to stand up against, you know, the juggernaut of the state, of, of, of an entire army on your own. I mean, it takes an awful a lot of courage to do that single-handedly, uh, with all the risks that that entails, um, particularly somewhere like China. Um, so I think it, it, it stands as a very, very powerful symbol uh, for, for a lot of people. The image of the tank man is, is recognised all over the planet, except in China, where it's still censored from social media. And if you run into someone who is prepared to discuss the Tiananmen incident in China, it's not the photograph that they bring up, the one that they're far more likely to mention is called the Bus Man, and that's the image of a uh, People's Liberation Army soldier hanging from a burnt-out bus. And that's the message that the party wants to send uh, within China, that there was a dangerous counter-revolutionary rabble within the square, and that they had to be stopped. People growing up in China who were born after the Beijing massacre, for example, do not know that the Beijing massacre ever happened. The protests have been described by some people as forgotten history in China. So it's not uncommon for Chinese students to come abroad and have never heard about this date. 30 years since the massacre, it still can't be discussed in China. And now a new leader is threatening to take the country in an even more authoritarian direction. The big question is whether China's increasing confidence can be contained within its borders, or whether the whole world might soon have to bow to Beijing. For much of the last millennium, it was China that led the world, only for it all to come crashing down in a fall from grace unequaled in world history. And yet, the story of China today is that of a meteoric comeback from down and out melting pots and pans for steel to an industrial powerhouse and global superpower, all in just half a century. So what are the secrets behind this extraordinary reversal of fortunes? And just how far could China go? For many, the answer lies with her ambitious current leader. Xi Jinping was born soon after the end of China's century of humiliation and seems determined not to see China so humbled again. 
Xi Jinping's vision for China is to create a powerful, strong country, uh, and one which is wealthy. So really Xi Jinping articulates this sense of national renaissance and of China which will never again be a victim, of China which will never again be done down. To ensure China's dominance, first he secured as much power as possible for himself. Well, Xi Jinping is clearly the most powerful leader of China since Mao Zedong. So the party constitution said that as president he should stand down in 2023. That's now been changed. He can stand again. It's very likely he will. And he will probably stay in power as Putin in Russia uh, for some considerable time. I mean, he's in his um, sort of late 60s, so in theory, he could be around for quite a while. Before he even came to power, China's economic reforms were already bearing fruit. The Chinese people's entrepreneurial spirit, forged long ago during the Song Dynasty, constrained during its century of humiliation and the disastrous Mao years, was finally free again. Today, the possibility of wealth is fueling a new Chinese dream. The dollar sign is everything. And how, who has a bigger cars, who has better houses, bigger TVs, all of that materialistic thing become a sig signal of who you are. That's the way of finding your identity in the society. So the old way of courtesy, generosity, all of that's the thing that makes China very proud of a history is diminishing. Political power only comes with the economical growth. So in China, everything is about how do you accumulate more wealth. Xi Jinping's China is also a digital China where the party state has capacities to monitor individuals in ways that was not imaginable previously. When China was under Chairman Mao, it was a totalitarian state. There was not any aspect of life in China that was not under the control of the Communist Party. So it is a much smarter, better targeted version of an old-fashioned authoritarian system and a Maoist totalitarian state. The might of a huge workforce, the power of an authoritarian government, and the dynamism of capitalism have combined to make China unstoppable. Under Xi Jinping, it's extended its massive construction boom to other countries and is building a huge development of roads and railways, ports and pipelines across the world. Because China has done so well with its economic growth, um, they need new markets. There's only so many mobile phones you can sell to your domestic population. There's only so many cars the Chinese can buy. They need to expand beyond China's borders into new markets. Xi Jinping is trying to encourage the people of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan to use Chinese rail standards and to buy Chinese trains and to use Chinese architects and to basically extend China's markets beyond its own borders. What it's doing is basically saying, OK, we are important, we have a big economy. I think for Xi Jinping, this is the sort of geopolitical vision, you know, the, the vision of a society which now can live beyond its borders in a way that can reach out into the world around it. A China which has the economy it does um, can't really just restrain itself. But as China's wealth has grown under Xi, so has its confidence. It's already started flexing its military muscles in its own backyard. The South China Sea is an area of immense maritime dispute between China and many of its neighbors. It's both uh, a very rich area in terms of fishing and minerals, and also because it's very important to have free access to the South China Seas, because that means that then access to the coast of East Asia becomes much easier. Essentially, China claims almost all of the South China Sea as being historically Chinese uh, maritime uh, uh, territory, so to speak. To increase their claim on these waters, China has been going to astonishing lengths, finding semi-submerged sandbanks and turning them into islands. In order to make that an island worth planting a flag in, you've got to chuck tons of rocks in it and then surface it with cement. So these are artificial islands. Um, so it's quite an insidious uh, policy um, designed to push China's borders 
uh, further out, not in terms of little areas around little islands, but linking islands together so that China's general border is further out. China has built runways on these artificial islands, allowing them to increase their military presence in the area. Tensions with neighboring countries and the US have increased. But China's latest front line of authoritarian expansion is one that has a bigger impact on the UK. In 1997, Britain handed control of Hong Kong back to China, under the promise that some democratic rights would be preserved. Today, demonstrations in Hong Kong have been continuing for more than a year, as people see the freedoms they were promised by Beijing disappear. I guess what was never expected in 1997 when the handover happened was uh, that you would have you know, kind of China explode economically. Um, and so, you know, there's been an imbalance really. China has come from sort of nowhere to being so economically important. And I think that it's now less and less likely to inhibit what it wants to do in Hong Kong. It feels very strong and confident. There's a kind of proposal from Beijing to have a uh, sort of security law that seems to really uh, kind of creep into Hong Kong's autonomy, basically saying that Beijing can say who is a sort of political problem and that how they should be dealt with. Hong Kong's autonomy has been eroded. It still has some privileges, but it's really questionable, you know, how, how sustainable those are going to be as it faces a Beijing that's more and more kind of assertive. The British took Hong Kong from China almost 200 years ago. Now, China has taken it back. The big question is just how aggressive China might become, not just in its own backyard, but across the world. So this is very kind of, uh, you know, sort of disconcerting that you've got this huge power, but it doesn't really have a common political and cultural language with most of the other major countries, so the West should be nervous about China. For people who believe in the rights and dignity of the individual, in the rule of law, and in democratic system, then the continued rise of China under the Communist Party and Xi Jinping is going to make your life not very pleasant. The trouble is, there may be very little that the West can do about it. The 21st century belongs to China, and that's not that weird an assertion to make, because many previous centuries have as well. Um, throughout much of human history, if a UFO landed on this planet and an alien said, take me to your leader, the emperor of China would probably be the natural choice. And so there's been an anomaly uh, for a few centuries, but what we actually see now is a kind of a correction of China's centrality in the world order. China's modern resurgence from down and out to world leader in just a few decades is perhaps the greatest success story of the 21st century. But when told as part of her thousand year history, it should come as no surprise. This is a people who have shown they can rise above the most shocking adversity, a nation that has a determination to succeed written into its DNA. As the world becomes more uncertain, China looks set to dominate once again.